right, I am back. Checking audio really quick, but uh, yeah, all right. Back we go. Okay, so uh, we got run after, maybe, hopefully. Uh, yeah, okay, so we're, co we're, we're converting that, that floating point number into a, to an integer, and that, that should be fine. Should be fine. Uh, we don't care, care about sub-second precision uh, for, for this. Uh, we're, we're, we haven't implemented the part yet where we're actually putting the score in. So this, this is assuming the values are already there. Um, okay. So anyway, so now we want to ha handle this case, right? So if, uh, if run after is greater than now, then we're going to add it back. Maybe, uh, and otherwise, and, and continue. I don't know what these things are. What is NX and CH supposed to be? Nonsense. All right. So timestamp is a method that lets us convert the number of non leap second cents. Yeah, then. Um, okay, so this, this converts this back. Now, is that really necessary? No, because we could just give it score back. Why would we? Why would we convert it back? Uh, so, right. So we call z add. Z add adds one member to a sorted set or updates the score if it already exists. So we uh, bz pop min removed it, and so we're gonna add it back. Um, so we're gonna add it back, and then we're gonna wait. How long is a while? Apparently one second. Um, let's see, can we, okay, this is a const function. So I think what we can do is maybe uh, we can define a constant. Do I want to define that constant here or do I want to pass it to pop task? Ugh. Hmm. Excuse me. So if I if I pass it to pop task, then I can pass it. Uh, what is this retried? Okay, cool. So then I can define other define other constants here. In fact, I probably. Can I can I do this? Can I just like, like define this here, and also define const? Um, uh, let's see. Let's say this is the um, no task ready delay we'll, we'll set it to every minute for now and these things could be parameterized uh, if I did that what I would probably do is I would probably read from like an environment variable and then if the vi environment variable wasn't, wasn't present I could have this, or I could make it so that the environment variable is required. Pros and cons for 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 <laughs> for that. Um, but if I'm going to do this, then in pop task, I'm going to pass this in here, and we're going to add that. We try delay. 
chrono duration. And then it restated the thing that I already had. Cool. And then type is wrong. Uh, the order of things is wrong. Okay, Z add is supposed to take key member score. Key member score. So what's the problem? What if I what if I just get rid of this? You're still not happy. Are you happy with that? It takes four generic argument. Oh, of course it does. Oh right, because the the fourth one is the return value, and we're we're gonna say that it's a it's a unit, right? Because we don't actually need uh, the return value from Ziad. Okay, that fixes that. Now what was he doing? Oh yeah, retry delay. So we have this retry delay now. So we're gonna use that to sleep for this amount of time. Expected duration found time delta. What do you mean? It's an alias of time delta. Okay. So this wants a different kind of duration. A time duration. Cool. Um, okay. Core time? STD time? What's the difference? I don't know. <laughs> that makes that happy and that makes this unhappy, of course, naturally. Um, so, fine, STD time duration, oh, whoops, it doesn't have a minutes function. As a from seconds <sighs> sixty, sure, and of course, this type should be this. It's fine for now. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna sleep. What does STD thread sleep actually do? Puts the current thread to sleep for at least a specified amount of time. The thread may sleep longer than the duration specified due to scheduling specifics or platform dependent functionality. It will never sleep less. This function is blocking and it should not be used in async functions. This is not an async function. Um, Yeah, because of the nature of pop task and our expectation that it's always going to give a task or an error, it, it could have been a choice to treat this situation as an error. Um, but then the current way this is implemented, we would, we would panic and exit the process. And I think that's uh, not what I want. So then I'd have to have like some specific error types and then do different things depending on the error. And I don't think it's really an error if we have tasks. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely not an error because we will have tasks that, um, again, the, the purpose 
of this change in our tasking is because of the fact that um, I can really, I have potentially dozens of videos to upload to YouTube and I can only upload a couple a day because of API limits. So we will have tasks that won't be processable for days. So we will have a task where, or a queue where all the tasks, uh, none of the tasks are ready to be processed. And so this condition is gonna happen quite a lot. Um, and we're gonna be checking every minute. Given the fact that that, that checking is really <laughs> um, getting a single item for Reddit from Redis and doing some math, I'm not too worried about that being a lot of work. We'll have two task workers currently. They'll be checking once a minute. Um, that will be fine. So the trade-off here is like um, the larger this duration is, there will be more circumstances and where uh, circumstances where the task worker could be sleeping, um, where I might queue up a task to do immediately, and it won't be around to. It won't. It'll be. It'll be sleeping on the job, right? On the other hand, the the lower this value is, the more often it's going to check. It's going to pull. Um, which is pretty inexpensive, but I'm willing to have the thing wait a minute. Um, what's likely to happen here is um, I'm gonna queue up a task. A, a likely scenario is I'll have a bunch of queued up tasks that have hit their retry uh, because of uh, API limits, the quota. For the YouTube API, I might try to upload additional YouTube videos those won't be set to try later. They'll try to run immediately. They'll also hit the quota and then they'll get a uh, retry um, a run after value, you know, a day or two in the future. Some of those will get through, some of them won't. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a thing. Well, that's fine. So that handles the reading portion right, getting the task. Uh, and we've we've already handled the updating run after to set it to have a future value. Um, and we've set it so that the task, the microservice running the task can return a, ret re a uh, retry after, or whatever that is, yeah, retry after with a value so that we can have the task um, processing unit that's doing the work tell us how long to wait to try again uh, which is a good thing and then Q task I think is the next thing to uh, to work on we could probably just kind of run down the list right so we just finished uh, pop task which is now kind of like a, a peak <laughs> uh, it's a it's a well we don't really have a way of, well, hmm. So if we look at the documentation, I wonder if there's something, right? So we're using BZ pop min. Is there a BZ peak min? <laughs> uh, BZ pop max, Z adds, what does Z card do? Returns the set, sort of, oh, how many elements are in the sorted set, okay. C diff, C in C answer, center. Cool. So then I have to go read what this is to understand what the other thing is. The intersection of num key. Okay, intersections. Okay, cool. score returns the score of a member uh, Z range returns specified range of elements in the sort of set stored at key
Um, okay, so one risk here. Yeah, I'm so so I could use something like Z range to like look at the sorted set and look at the the smallest value. But if I do that, I'm gonna make worse the situation that I already have, which is that the task worker could run and could pop an item. And then while it's processing this, before it puts it onto the working list or it puts it back, um, here where it puts it back. So like if, if the process crashes here somewhere, uh, we lose the task, right? It's just gone. Um, or if we, if it crashes, you know, before here, it's just gone. Um, I wonder if the Redis transaction stuff would let us, you know, ensure against that possibility. Um, I'd have to look at that further. But I'm not too worried about it. This is not, yeah, it would be annoying to queue up a task to upload something and then it just didn't happen, but I would notice that. Uh, so I'm willing to live with it for now. We can put a to-do. Or you know what's even better because it doesn't rely on me looking at the source code later in the future <laughs> to discover, oh, hey, I should think about this. Uh, we have a list of things to do. Uh, I don't suppose I have like a transaction. Okay, no. Look at doing uh, Redis transactions for um, task queue processing. Okay, it's on the list at the very bottom, which is fine. All right, so anyway, let's, make, let's try to make some more progress. So that's that's pop task. Uh, remove task from temp queue uh, shouldn't really change. Like the temp, the temporary queue is the 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 working list of the things that are being currently processed, um, and that mechanism hasn't changed. We just scan through the list looking for the task key. Um, and we remove one of them. Shouldn't be multiple instances of the, the task on the temp queue, but it's fine. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave this alone for right now. I, yeah, I'll tell you what. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get, we're gonna get through <laughs> updating this and then maybe actually test it. Um, all of, all of the changes and how we're using Redis here. And then we can come back and address these to-dos because I do want to address the to-dos. Uh, okay, so queue task now is different, um, but we actually have an example of what that looks like because we had to do that to re-queue the task. Uh, create task isn't changing at all. Uh, so we'll hide all that. Publish task status isn't changing either. That um, using pub sub is uh, is not affected by what we're doing here. Um, so yes, I will address the to dos. I'm just gonna like start hiding things so I can kind of focus on the part that I'm doing something about. All right. So uh, where is pop task? There it is. You know what's handy sometimes? The outline. I rarely use the outline. But then, you know, you have a, a really compressed uh, view of things. Okay, so in here, we call Ziad, right? Ziad, Q named, uh, task key store, right? So um, I probably am just going to take this code. Oops, undo, undo, control Z. Okay, there we go. Um, and then we're going to replace this code here with new code. Um, 
Right, we don't really have the full task object yet. So, actually, I think I'm gonna leave this here, right? Just because you're copying and pasting code, just because the code is duplicated somewhere, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'm not just saying that because I'm about to do it, but because the kind of the, the way we're using the code is different, right? So here, what we wanna do is we have the same queue name, but we don't have a task key string in the other place where we're doing this. We have a, um, or sorry, we do have that. In this case, we have a task object that has a key and we can read from that. Uh, and then we don't have a score yet, but we'll, we'll calculate that. And then, yeah, we're just gonna bring this up. There we go. And what are we missing? Some things. Uh, let's see, so that, and then that. Expected results, right. So we just need to do this. There we go. And then we're missing uh, one of those curly braces I removed. Uh, right, so now we just need to calculate score. So that's task run after timestamp as a floating point number. And it's done. Okay, so that's that's Q task, right? So we, we are looking at this task um, uh, struct that we have. It has a run after, um, uh, date time, and we just pull the timestamp, uh, and that's going to be the score that we're going to use to put into the sorted set using Z add. Um, so we add the task key. It's it's assumed here that if we have this task um, struct, that the actual task is stored, like that task key is the key to a, um, a hash set in Redis, and so we're just kind of referencing it. Uh, it's not on us to do anything about that hash set in here. Um, so that's that's queue task. So we, we queue the task, um, and then we'll come back to this. And then this is pop task, and we're done with that. And then I don't think, yeah, there's nothing to do on update task status because we're just updating the different fields in the hash set um, and publishing task status and those sorts of things. So we're not changing anything there. And uh, so there's some to do's, but I think structurally this gets us a priority queue. Now by default, the way this is implemented, um, so I think we have to look at the task API next, to see if there's anything. So let me save this and see if that hasn't broken anything. So when we create a task, So we have this create task input that's kind of the payload that defines that and we have a create handler uh, just ignore that to do just keep ignoring that to do uh, we call create task and create task currently okay it's defined here and this is what is populating the hash set in redis and then building that task uh, struct right and so current the the default implement like the, this implementation sets run after to be the current date and time the same as last updated um and the reason for that is this the simple like when we create a task initially right off the bat it should just be processed immediately so if uh if all of this is good let's uh let's do docker compose up and we'll rebuild We should be able to go into the app and see that 
um, tasks are getting queued and they get processed, I'll find something, um, I'll find one of the existing uh, stream records and we can do like um, speech to text or silence detection. Silence detection will be faster. That'll be the fastest task. It's not gonna um, exercise our retry after timestamp logic because it won't fail, one. And two, none of the services yet have implemented the returning the 503 error with the retry after um, header. And that is kind of the next thing to do after this to see that to see that working although I suspect uh, let's see if we go to a tab one of many tabs but the one that has uh, there we go Google Cloud so bright. How are we doing on quota today? Do I have quota again? Has it been has it been long enough? The funny thing is, is after you know working on this last week and thinking about you know this stream and working on this more. It has helped me remember to go into the, the app and trigger uploads every once in a while. Um, thus making this work less, less valuable. But yeah, we have quota again. So I could, if I had more videos to upload, um, I don't have any ready to upload right now. These don't have rendered um, video files yet, which, uh, is the thing that can probably be in this UI as well. Is that, is the, uh, is there a renderable, uh, is there a rendered video, which is what this, this is trying to load. We're kind of slow right now. Probably because of the build process. Yes. This might be a minute. Oof. Okay, so um, I'm assuming this is going to not break things. We'll see if that's true here shortly. Uh, then the next thing to do is going to be to go into the YouTube upload API microservice and add that new logic to check to see if we're getting a, uh, if the API error that we're getting is from exceeding the quota. And if it is, we're turning a 503 error with the retry after uh, header. And then I'm gonna probably trigger another build. And then at that point we can go back and maybe address some of those to-dos. I think there's, it's, I think one of the to-dos was one of the functions still needs to return a result type instead of uh, panicking and then we had a couple of functions that should really be more private inside of the the lib.rs for task worker and then I think those are actually still being called from places in the task worker or the task API that, that need to be updated to, to not call those not need to call those so we'll see you shall see Well, 
done with that tab. What's this? Ah, one of the stack overflows I was looking at, trying to figure out how we're gonna do priority queues. Hmm, interesting. Not really relevant to what I'm doing, but this was helpful for color for like, oh, Z add is a thing. Um, and then, oh yeah, I could read a little bit about tr transactions here. So how do transactions work? How transactions work in Redis, great. A lot of execution of a group of commands in a single step. Okay. They're serialized and executed sequentially. The exec command triggers execution of all commands in the transaction. So if a client loses connection to the server in the context of a transaction before calling exec, none of the operations are performed. Hey, Lady Rasai. Hello, hello. How's it going? <laughs> Vibes? Let's see, we, uh... Okay, we're not dropping frames. For a little bit there, uh... It's a little laggy on my end, but, uh... Oh, the build is finished. The build, the build has failed. Uh, that, that's, that's good that we discovered that. Task worker, trait, serialize is not implemented for date time, UTC. Last updated, well, that's interesting. So, yeah, task worker, SRC lib. So we're trying to, we have this task struct. And we say we can serialize and deserialize it. Now I'm not sure that that's actually strictly necessary, right? So the purpose of the, so drive this macro uh, allows us to say, hey, this struct can, um, There's, it basically hooks it up to like a serialization mechanism to be able to take this task and turn it into a, I don't know, a JSON string or something. Do we need that? What is that for? Is that, is that something that's actually for the task API that we're leveraging? Are we pulling in task VR? What are we doing with that? Okay, so like here, we are taking tasks and turning them into JSON. So this wouldn't work if we didn't have that serialize uh, derive. Is this, is this the only place we're referencing task directly? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, any type interpolated into an array element or object value must implement, implement this serialized trait. While any type interpolated into object key must implement serialized sets fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I could. Um, build out what we're returning here myself. rather than just trying to take the record. See, what we're leveraging here is we get this hash map from Redis, string to string, and we're taking advantage of the fact that we can do record.into to convert this into a task. And then we're serializing it. So we're leveraging kind of a lot of these things defined here. Um, maybe the easiest thing to do is define how to serialize uh, last updated and run after. So, Copilot is suggesting that I do this, which maybe is a thing that actually exists. 
and might maybe do a representation of this value as seconds. Is that is that a thing? It maybe. Uh, I don't think. Are we are we using last updated anywhere? Yes. I think this might actually work. If this was actually a number of seconds, hold on. What is Chrono Serde TS seconds? Can we, there we go. Uh, serialize, deserialize two from timestamps in seconds. Well, that's handy. Okay, so that does what you would think it would do. So that means that this task that last updated in the front end is going to be a number of seconds. And when we call new date with that value in seconds, that should actually work. Now, this is gonna be broken. Uh, maybe last viewed task timestamp. What is that value? Where does that come from? Okay, that comes from use tasks. All right, so currently it thinks that last updated is a string. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, and that's not happy about that, but that's fine. We'll just do new date. I feel like there's probably, there was already a bug in how we were handling this. So this is, this is good. unhappy about some things okay thinks that last view task timestamp is a string uh, that makes sense because it probably is um, mm. so this is gonna be a whole thing uh, let me I do need to fix this, but I, I, it's going to be kind of, um, I've already, I've already lost track of the thing that I was working on before on the back end. Yeah. What we need to do is I think do something like this. And then, um, yeah, something like that, except, uh, sure, sure. I don't, I don't know why we need, yeah, I don't think we need that condition. And then we create a function called the thing that this used to be called. And its job is to convert that date that it gets passed into a string representation. Okay. And then most of the errors go away. Uh, this is an error. <laughs> it isn't the type here task. Yeah. Good. And then 
new date. This is why you don't use any. It just hides errors. So the reason I was looking at the front end is because the, there are implications, right? If we change how things are serialized, um, and this this comes down to the fact that this used to just be a string, but then when, when we're passing around the task struct in the back in the back ends, then well, what is the format of that string? What does that string mean? Um, was ambiguous and uncertain and not well defined, and so. Uh, I switched to use this datetime uh, struct provided by Chrono, um, and so that that then had implications because now we had to tell it how to serialize it, uh, and that changed it to be okay. Now it's a number of seconds or whatever. It's a number, uh, but that that seems to be fine. Um, is that going to address our build issue? Was that what it was? It was just like the serialize and deserialize. Let's, um, I think maybe cargo build is going to be faster because I can just cargo build the whole project in one go versus doing Docker compose up. Okay. So we had some warnings, but they're the same warnings about these macros that I wrote once upon a time. Um, so I think this is probably good then. So let's do Docker compose up now. Maybe it'll work this time. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, going back to this, how does this work? The exec command triggers the execution of all commands in the transaction. Uh -huh. Okay. So if it crashes, it's possible only a partial number of the operations are registered. Risk will take this condition on restart and will exit with an error. Then you have to fix it. Optimistic locking, usage. Okay, so we say multi, and then we do things, and they get queued, and then we, when we call exec, then we get the result. So... If we try to do a transaction, right? So this this is stemming from a question, right? And the question is in in pop task. In pop task, we want to uh, call bz pop min, and we want to get a result, and then based on that result, we want to either put it back or we want to add it to a different list and if anything goes wrong we want to unwind everything but this entails like getting data and then taking an action based on that data and it looks like this is we don't we can't see results like we don't actually nothing actually it's, it's just like queued up stuff <laughs> rather than something where we can interactively like 
see a view of the, the, the data as it's being changed and then commits everything. This is, this is an interesting statement. It doesn't support rollbacks of transactions, but it has a discard command to abort a transaction. So, so what are we really saying here? I mean, in like a relational database, you can have like nested transactions and you can roll back, you know, an inner transaction and not the outer one, depending on the database, yada, yada, yada. And I understand that supporting that, but this, this feels like contradictory or I, I guess trying to make a nuance that, oh no, we don't, we don't have rollbacks of transactions, but we have the ability to abort a transaction and uh, the state of, is returned to normal, but the reality is, is this isn't really a transaction in a, in a sense might be a more honest way of putting this. <laughs> this is like queuing up commands to then execute atomically. I guess that is a transaction. It's not the kind of transaction you would expect from a relational database. Maybe a, a, a different word could be better or a big disclaimer. that the transactions uh, are different in that way. Optimistic locking using check and set. Okay. Uh, next track. <laughs> Watch is used to provide check and set behavior to Redis transaction. Watched keys are monitored in order to detect changes against them. If at least one watch key is modified before the exec command, the whole transaction aborts. Okay. Okay. So this is potentially useful. We would be able to say, hey, we want to modify um, you know this key and we want to modify this list and if anything else messes with them I think that could potentially be useful if we were to use the range to look at the contents of the queue first and then make a decision, then we could say if the queue changed or if the working set, the working list changed, then abort the transaction and we'll retry again. Kind of this cooperative uh, situation. Now, if this, if 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 we were in a circumstance where this was a more likely and a bigger deal, um, maybe just not using Redis would be the thing to do. We have a Postgres database. We have stuff in, um, so we could use that instead. That's that's definitely an option to be considered. Um, and you have more powerful transactions. <laughs> Using watch to implement Zpop. Uh, hey, is are they going to have an example of the, exactly the thing I'm talking about? Okay, good example to illustrate how watch can be used. Uh, Zpop and Zpop X and the blocking variants have only been added in version five, so we already have that. So this is talking about if you didn't have these things and you wanted them in an earlier version of Redis. So really for illustrative purposes, right? 
Um, so not talking about the thing. I wonder, um, Z-Pop Men, let's take a look at this. Okay, so it does take account. It does take account. It'd be cool if there was a, a Z-Pop Men where you could give it a value. <laughs> and don't, don't give me a value smaller than, um, or no, larger than this value. That would like that like that would perfectly address the use case, right? Of um, don't give me values in the future. But that doesn't seem to be a thing that exists, so that's fine. This this will work, maybe. Uh, so we did we did build. Oh, it failed again. Could not find Surdy and Chrono. I could have sworn. Oh, um, one possibility is that in, excuse me, there we go. It was like clicking and it wasn't doing anything. It was very odd. Um, so we have Chrono, but we don't have features for Chrono. So there might be a Surdy, um, feature that we're missing. So this does tell me though that doing cargo build from the top level is not going to turn up these errors. Um, so if I did task worker cargo build, Is this going to work now? Yes. Okay. So running cargo build from the top level is not going to demonstrate that everything is going to compile. It's good to know. We do have a top level cargo uh, TOML file. It looks like it's not open any of the keys, please. <laughs> Cargo Tommel. Looks like this. It just has a list of members. Looks like request needs an update. Do that at some point. Okay, maybe it will succeed this time. I'll be able to see this in, in action. But uh, for now, I'm gonna take a break here while this is building and uh, go stretch my legs. I'm sitting here for an hour, uh, get some circulation, and uh, I'll be back in uh, a few minutes, uh, hopefully with a, a, a built application, and uh, we can try queuing up a task and seeing if that works. And then, um, yeah, moving on to the other to-dos, yes. BRB.